Hello and welcome to the Fen Den. I'm your host, Sean Allen Fen, and my goal is to win your hearts and to change your minds. Hey, welcome to the Fen Den. In three seconds, I'm going to say a word and it's going to get your attention. And you, are you ready? Sex. That's what this episode is about. It's a, not only about sex, but it's about art. And not only is it about sex and art, but it's, it's about people acting absurd and ridiculous. But isn't that what we do anyway? Isn't that what we're really good at? I bring this up because at the at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, there is a painting by Balthus that is has become all of a sudden I don't know why now, but all of a sudden it's controversial. This painting has been has existed since 1938. Oh, but now <laughs> there's some kind of controversy. It's a painting entitled Therese Dreaming. And it shows a young girl leaning back with her underwear visible. But it's a painting. And it's, this isn't the same museum where there's a bunch of nudes who aren't wearing any underwear. So what is the freaking difference? It's just context, I guess. But in this wacky, topsy-turvy world that we live in, where every day you hear about a male celebrity who's who's in trouble for um, for sexual misconduct and uh, in the climate, you know, a social climate of of uh, overly sensitive people. I mean, I'm not talking about the people who truly, you know, had bad things happen to them, but. It's to the point where there are people that are just overly, overly sensitive, especially what good is art when art is censored? And how how is that not going to give it more attention? So, in spite of this controversy over this painting, I mean, this painting is getting a lot of attention now. And... Uh, Again, why now? I mean, it's it is actually he's a, he's a, a new, he was an amazing painter, and uh, and it's just I mean he he depicted these sort of innocuous scenes that could be construed as voyeuristic, but at the same time, art is a reflection of the human condition, is not is it not because. I mean, what is are some of the most popular paintings about? They're often um, they're often depictions of nudes, and in particular, I'm just it boggles my mind why this painting has uh, has come across controversy, um, and. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, in in 1866, Gustave Courbet uh, depicted the um, a female nude with her legs spread open, and it's L'Origin du Monde, Origin of the World. And how how is someone not offended by that? Oh no, it's a painting of a of a naked woman. Oh no, what? What kind of scandal is this? It makes me so uncomfortable and offended. And, uh, they're true. I mean, people are going to get offended. And if it's art that you're getting offended over, well, just leave the gallery. It's not for you. Art is not for everyone. It really is not. And if you're offended by artwork and you actually bring it up, you're going to draw more attention to it. And so if that's what you want to do, then go for it. Knock yourself out. 
because you're actually doing us a favor and you're actually doing the art dealers and the museum people and the gallerists a favor and the auctioneers you're doing them a favor by bringing controversy to a painting so thank you thank you very much it just increases the value there was just this past summer uh, uh, another incident of a scandalous painting if you remember do you remember that uh dana shoots painting of emmett till that got a lot of flack got a lot of controversy when it was in the whitney even though when it first it first showed in berlin and there was no controversy so berlin's okay with this so what's the deal america in America, apparently, you can't, you can't make art about life. Well, life may imitate art. If art imitates life, you're going to get some controversy from some, some really uptight people. And how dare you, person who protests art and makes petitions, how dare you be so freaking religious about it and get up on your soapbox and be so self-righteous about pointing fingers at things like this that are so like fruitless and a waste of time and a total distraction from the true issues. You know, I encourage you to not let people get away with bad behavior but when you start trying to censor art and and I don't mean like uh, I don't mean like taking down bad men who like they're they're clearly acting badly and they shouldn't they shouldn't be allowed to get away with it but the just the fact that you would get uptight about a painting and just based off your opinion and your perception of it, who are you to be the judge of that painting? Are you, are you freaking Jerry Saltz? Are you an art critic? Are you, are you now the world's top art critic and now you know everything? Are you the arbiter of what makes good art and what is bad? You know, shame on you. Shame on you, Mia Merrill, the petition's author, who suggested that the painting be replaced by one created by a female artist of the same period. Who, who is this person, and why, why does she have the right to dictate what the Metropolitan of Museum of Art has up on their, you know, it, she's not freaking head of the museum, we'll do the... Who the hell is she? What does she know? She knows nothing. You know what? Mia Merrill, at Mia Z Merrill on Twitter. Right now, I'm, gonna, I'm writing a tweet to her and re replying to her thing, her tweet on November 30th. It says, I put together a petition asking the Met to take down a piece of art that is undeniably romanticizing the sexualization of a child no it isn't who are you to judge I'm going to tell her say shame on you let's see what she does let's see what she says I'm going to say shame on you tweet I sent it shame on you lady what the hell do you know I can't stand it these people that get on their freaking high horse. They're just as bad as religious people telling you're going to, you're going to hell. Like, I don't want to hear that. Like, you're, who, who, how do you know? <laughs> it's freaking ridiculous. I can't stand it. So I just did that. I sent her a tweet and I said, shame on you. Let's see if she like gets mad at me and replies or not. But I mean, come on. What, you have nothing better to do? You just want to get attention and like, she just wants to get attention, but for a reason like this, it's a freaking painting. 
I'm going to get offended at freaking the David painting because he has a fig leaf over his genitalia, and that offends me because how does that fig leaf sting up like that without... Uh, you know, and when they film sex scenes for movies and, and uh, you know, TV, the the male actors have to wear this, like... My friend who's an actor showed me, or showed us. I'll have him on on the fend end but he he showed me the thing that they have to use like during the sex scenes that they put you know they cover his his junk with it uh you know so it's like this wire this is like, he explained it I, i'd have to i have to try it on sometime and so he, i can really explain it better but i mean i'm offended if you're not offended then you should be. <laughs> if you're not offended at everything, you know, if everything doesn't offend you right now, if you're not offended by me, then you should be offended because I take offense to you not being offended. I take offense to you not being offended that I'm not offended. And I think that is the real issue here. So anyway, the museum is not going to take the painting down. A spokesman... Uh, said that their decision not to remove the painting provides an opportunity to reflect on today's culture. And that's what art is. That's the purpose of art is to give us, you know, to show us who we are. Art is a mirror. This is who we are. And you can't change who we are by taking down a painting. I don't know what you're trying to prove, lady. I don't know what you're trying to accomplish. But... Mia Merrill, get over yourself, lady. Was she offended at uh, Dana Schutz's painting of uh, Emmett Till? Where was she then? Where was this Mia? Where is this Mia lady then to like protest art? When uh, this painting of Emmett Till was, if you remember, uh, the artist used a found image. And it was uh, based off the photograph of Till's mutilated corpse in his coffin. And uh, it's a thickly painted painting. It's uh, in shades of dark brown and black. And uh, on the other side, uh, his uh, white dress shirt is uh, prominent. and But his face is kind of, you know, mutilated. And uh, it's a really graphic painting, but it's 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 pretty amazing. It's really beautiful. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> to say a terrible painting like that is beautiful. I don't know if that's the right adjective, but I mean, art should be provocative. I mean, it provokes and it and it stimulates this discourse that we should have about. Uh, I mean, at that time, there was so much uh, violence in the news, you know, so much violence against black people from cops or whatever. And, um, and it was part of, it's part of the discourse and it's something that, you know, we should, we should talk about and the artists should depict and, and bring it to our attention because it's, it's a mirror. But, you know, where was this lady getting offended about that then? It's like, oh, so this, that, so that Emmett Till painting is not offensive to her even though it's a painting of, of a mutilated dead black man who was wrongfully, you know, killed and stuff. And she wasn't offended about that. So she must be racist. So, Mia, you're clearly racist. Because I didn't hear you complaining about the Emmett Till. But you're complaining about this Balthus painting. Because it's a white girl. I see how you are, lady. And uh, and the fact is that Berlin in Ber- when the painting showed in Berlin the Emmett Till painting, there was no controversy. But when it comes to America, all of a sudden there's controversy, and at the same time, in, in other media there's so much violence. I mean, in movies and TV there's so much violence. Uh, so why are people getting offended over a painting, but they're not getting offended over violence and 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 on you know on cable television or whatever 
And where are the protests? They're they're sort of just people are just misguided, misdirected. But at the same time, that is what art is for. So we have so it gives us um, a signifier to you know identify where we are as a culture, who we are, and and how we are hypocrites, you know, as a whole. And that that is why these paintings should never be censored is because they're there to show us who we are. And uh, Dana Schutz never uh, intended to sell the painting. And so she didn't make a profit off of it. I mean, she got attention and, and the value of her other work increased, granted, because of this painting and because she was in the Whitney. But she didn't sell and never intends to sell this painting this open open casket painting and uh it's it's, it's, it's art man and that's what art is for it's, it shows us who we are i don't need to say it again <laughs> but it will it shows us who we are <laughs> as people as a society and if something's controversial then I'm more interested in why something is controversial and who is making it controversial and what is their motive. Well, there hasn't been any protest recently about the Gustave Corbet painting of a vagina, just like as a central like focal point of the painting. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no, no one protesting that right now. Maybe because it's not in the United States of America, it's in Paris. And so the attitudes of Parisians are like, they're not uptight in such a weird way that Americans are. Is it, am I right? I don't know. What do you think? Send me a tweet at Sean Allen Fenn and let me know. Did I offend you so far? Uh, are you not offended? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Find me on uh, Twitter, at Sean Allen Fenn. You're listening to The Fenn Den with your host, Sean Allen Fenn, where my goal is to win your hearts and change your attitude. Change your minds. Change your minds and have a good times on The Fenn Den. Yeah, so... I'm really glad that I can make time to do this podcast and I bring it to you every Friday. Last last week we had it was really excellent and uh, we had a poet and her name is Karina G. Lopez and she, she was part of this show called Live Big Girl and and we went to see it Saturday night and it was phenomenal. They were there it was so good. And it was only for one night but the we're keeping our fingers crossed that the thing will have more shows cuz it was really good. And uh if you listen to my last episode with Karina uh she you know she explained that again once again a lot of people get offended. And because they're, they're three women who are, they're not, they're not skinny bitches. They're the, they are, uh, full figured women speaking and, and making art about the, the way they're perceived and the criticism that she said that she got where people were were saying that she was promoting obesity and I can tell you that that is absolutely not what it was about and it it was just so good it was very powerful if they if you if they play it again if you know if they perform this again don't miss it 
I was at the National Black Theater in Harlem and uh, follow them on social media at uh, Live Big Girl. Really, really excellent. And uh, check out Karina's book. I actually did the uh, her book cover for her. Her book is called Jew Tina Journals. And it's a book of her poetry. It's really good. So that's my plug for Karina and uh, Live Big Girl. It was just really great. So so that's why I'm just gushing about it and, re- and uh, letting you know that if it if they show if they perform it again don't miss it before you can love anyone you have to love yourself and regardless of what society uh, implies that you have to do or say or look a certain way when there's enough discrimination and we don't need more of it when people are discriminated against age and discriminated because they're too old or too young or because of the color of their skin or their religion or their height or their body weight. There, That happens far too often and we, we don't, <laughs> you and I don't need to contribute to that. But as soon as we recognize who we are and if you believe in, in the divine and the, the creator, and even if you are not religious and don't believe in God, you still are able to recognize who you are and love yourself before you can even think about loving someone else effectively. And that was my takeaway, and, and that's something that I'm very passionate about in in that it's our responsibility to respect each other and to just admit that we I was going to say that we're not perfect but we are perfect and that's my point we are perfect exactly how we are. That's not to say that we are not becoming and still evolving to live up to our full potential. Because perfection is not static. It's It doesn't stand still. It keeps growing and growing and becoming and evolving. And that is why I'm here and why I do this podcast is to get the word out that you are perfect. I'm not saying you should settle for being mediocre. I'm just saying don't let society and, and you know people who are not enlightened, don't let them tell you what to do because they don't know. They're too busy protesting stupid things that don't matter instead of really making a difference. You know? It's too easy to be a critic. Here, I am criticizing. Yeah, that's too easy. But you know what I should be doing? I should be painting right now. But I'm making a pod I'm making a podcast, so so there. But my point is it's too easy to to criticize. But it takes just as much energy and it feels better to create. And so instead of protesting and making petitions, it's, it feels more rewarding and it's more effective if you actually create something good, you know, write a performance, write a play, make a painting that depicts how you see the world and get it up in a museum. And let that be the big news story. But instead we have negativity because that's what the human mind is most, uh, most responds to. I mean, that's, that's why the news are on 24-7, because they can hold your attention. And so 
If you're still listening, you're not an ordinary person who just responds to negativity, but you are listening to The Fen Den with your host, Sean Allen Fen. Are you a creative person who wants to make a difference and leave your mark on the world, make an impact? Are you an author, writer, designer, actor, uh, entrepreneur? Let me hear from you. I'm expanding my tight-knit circle. And uh, I want to hear from you and put you on this podcast. And I even encourage you to change my mind and change the mind of my listeners. But don't try too hard to change anyone's mind. Because as everyone knows, whatever you believe, you're going to believe it stronger when someone argues with you about it. So, don't argue with people. As long as you're willing to stand up for true justice, for things that matter, and defend the defenseless, not protest a painting, but actually get in the faces of people who are doing wrong. And like, uh, not only these famous dudes in the news like Wein- Harvey Weinstein or whatever and all these these guys are like every day we're hearing about someone else <laughs> who acted inappropriately or whatever well yeah those guys should be confronted but um, you know it's sad because we recently had a point where art did cross the line, and it was uh, because of a comedian who we don't have to talk and relive it you know, too much and, and, and bring attention uh, anymore. Uh, just to say I'm making the distinction that it's an uh, actual person's behavior that matters and not an inanimate object like a painting. But the actual behavior, you know, when someone is, is caught in the act. And, and you're just not jumping to conclusions and assuming things based off your whatever, like, soapbox you're on. But there's actually <laughs> evidence. And, uh, for example, like, the Catholic Church historically has a bad reputation for, for child abuse. And uh, recently, the uh, Melbourne Archbishop, Frank Little, was uh, uh, removed from from whatever, I don't know, I'm not Catholic, but, uh, you know, I heard about this, then Catholic, the Catholic Church has a problem with child molesters, and it's sad when religious people are the ones acting badly and being child molesters. That's unacceptable. It really is. And it reminds me of when I was, uh, uh, when I was like in my 20s or whatever. No, I was 18. And uh, I was going to this church and we had, uh, I had a band and we would practice and we were practicing this church. It was a vineyard church in Southern California. It was this this church called the Vineyard or whatever. And it's before I knew it was Jewish. And I was, you know, going to this this church. Yeah, I don't know if I told you this story to my listeners, but uh, I yeah, um, I didn't know I was Jewish until my mom when I was in my late twenties, my mom, uh, called me and said, guess what? We're Jewish. I'm like, okay. And it's funny because, uh, you know, I, I didn't know. And, but it's because there is the, we're descended from, uh, Jews who were, who converted to Catholicism and then eventually lost their identity assimilated into the local culture and uh and that was my family and then 
Anyway, back to my story. I was going to this church, and uh, my band goes into practice like we usually did. And uh, it was really weird, because we walked in, and the lights were off, and we knew they had a baseball team or whatever. Like, the youth pastor was a baseball... had. I think they were playing baseball or something. Uh, but it was all dark inside, and, and, and then we come in there, and he was acting weird. And, like, they're, they're, you know, the little boys were there. And we didn't really think anything of it. But then, not too long after, he got thrown in jail for child molestation. And uh, it was really alarming. And it was, like, at that point, it was I had I had enough <laughs> of of Christianity. I was done, and so that was it. That was the last straw. I never went back after that. And then I heard he died in prison, and uh, it was sad. And I mean, my heart goes out to those those kids who were hurt by this this guy who people trusted. And, uh, you know, the world is full of these so-called religious leaders who are just nothing but garbage. And it wasn't the last time that I would meet a false religious leader. But before I tell you about that, just a little backstory. I was uh, from, you know, I, my family was an uh, average middle class family, and I grew up in California and I wanted to be a rock star and so I would uh, move to San Francisco and had a little bit of local success in San Francisco but I wanted more I wanted to go bigger so I go naturally New York City is where I needed to go because that's that's where the legends go, you know, New York. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to make it big. So I go to New York, and I had this thirst for adventure and and uh, adrenaline, and so I failed, I failed hard. Before before my my next album came out, the band broke up, and uh, you know I guess the only the only one who really liked those songs was me, so it it didn't sell, it didn't do anything, and uh, I have I was already have been working for many years as uh, in retail cosmetics, and so. So that's what I was doing for work. And uh, when the economy crashed in 2008, you know, the customers, you know, stopped shopping. And so uh, I got laid off. And of course, I blame the economy or whatever. But the truth is that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't good enough. It was my, here's, here's kind of one, one new motto that, I live by is is that if you're a leader it's always your fault it should always be your fault never blame anyone else but at this point it was too quick to blame any anyone but me so I lost that job and uh, and then my rock and roll lifestyle was ridiculous because I didn't have any money coming in, but I would still try to live like a rock star, getting drunk every night and stuff. And so it got really bad, and I it turned out that I had to face some demons and hit rock bottom, and and I had to face the fact that I was an addict, and so I was in such despair. And it was a terrible feeling and of hopelessness and and I had hurt 
people around me and just acted like an idiot. And, uh, and now I was broken alone. And I thought there was no hope and thought I was doomed to be an addict for the rest of my life. The crazy thing about that mentality of that being addicted to the wrong thing is that like it's it's hopeless and it's not pretty. And then in there in my apartment in Williamsburg I had a divine encounter not to get all spiritual woo woo on you, but I really had a divine encounter to the point where I all of that darkness lifted and all of the despair lifted and, and, and that, that addiction was gone. And so I, I didn't desire to get drunk anymore. And, uh, all of a sudden didn't want to party like I used to anymore. And, and, uh, I just wanted to, you know, clean slate. And, uh, so I lost my ego and well, I know for some people that's that's a goal to lose your ego, but for me, not having ego, I also didn't have any direction, and so I eventually and unwillingly moved back home and moved back in with my parents, and by then I was almost forty. So living at home again, it was very humbling. And uh, so I enroll, enroll in the local community college and and uh, I eventually get back to New York because I love art and art's one of my passions. And so I, I go to art school, come, back, come to New York and go to art school. And I, I wanted to get into advertising and so there was this recurring pattern where I kept running out of money. So once again, I ran out of money. Couldn't afford to school, go to school anymore. And uh, by then, I had, I had met uh, some friends, some enemies, some allies, and a false religious leader. And so I didn't know who to trust now at this point because this guy turned out to be bad news. And uh, so there I was, like, I didn't know what to do and I had to make a decision. And so I decided to self-learn and I really got into reading books about building wealth, starting with... Uh, Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and The Cash Flow Quadrant, and then that just got me reading more uh, other books about how to manage my money, and then finding like free art classes, and and uh, starting a business online, so that turned into ArtLingo.com, and uh, but I started obsessing now, and now I'm. I became addicted to increasing my value to the marketplace and reading every everything I could find, every book I could find about about building wealth and about leadership and and uh, living up to my potential. And so, in so doing, I was able to shed my limiting beliefs. And so, here I am. And I know this podcast took a crazy turn telling you that story, but that's where I am. And that's why you're listening to The Fen Den with your host, Sean Allen Fen, where my goal is to win your hearts and keep on winning and change your minds, but not try to change. I'm not going to try to change your mind too hard, like I said. Cause that's just pointless. Cause I know I'm not gonna do it. You're just gonna, you're just gonna 
stick your feet deeper in the quicksand of what you believe. For example, when people resort to circular logic, like, the Bible is true because the Bible says it's true, and so therefore it's true. How do you know it's true? Well, because it says so. Okay. <laughs> cool. One of the funniest things in the Bible is, uh, in the Torah, how it's written, okay, uh, people accept that Moses wrote the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, right? And uh, after Moses dies, it keeps going. So who's writing that? And then, and then it also says that Moses was the most humble person who ever lived. I'm paraphrasing, but, but it does allude to Moses being the most humble person. And so, if, if he wrote the Torah, then he is truly, I'm truly humbled by being so humble. Aren't you? And so, it's cool though. I, I can dig it. Because what I like about, the good thing about religion is that it keeps people together bad thing about it, though, is it keeps people together <laughs> in, in, in the sense that when it gets dogmatic and you start to see someone else as the other, other than you, separate from you, and you can't relate to them, and it becomes a cause of needless wars and useless misunderstandings because people have preconceived ideas and then they inevitably tend to find every reason to reinforce those preconceived ideas, regardless of whether or not, uh, you know, new evidence contradicts those ideas. They'll still cling to their old ideas. And, and uh, as soon as you're able to let that go, you'll, you'll find that a whole new world opens up to you. But I'm going to... I mentioned... Uh, that, yeah, I am Jewish, and uh, my family didn't know we were Jewish. And uh, it's interesting to talk about, because for, you know, I don't know, maybe it's not interesting, maybe you're bored, but probably not. If you've listened this long, you're probably hanging on my every word. And I promise it's going to be exciting. So, as I come in for a landing on this episode of the Fenden, I'm going to just briefly give a little bit more detail about how my mom discovered she was Jewish. And so, you know, let's go, let's go back in history now to the Inquisition of 1492, when Jews and Muslims were expelled from Spain. And when uh, Queen Isabella and uh, Ferdinand expelled the Jews, <laughs> what's the problem with Jews? Why do people, why do people have a problem with the Jews? Uh, it's, it, I, don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but they expelled the Jews, and and uh, so. It may or may not be a coincidence that Christopher Columbus also sailed out of Spain exactly the same time when the edict was issued that expelled the Jews and the Muslims. And coincidentally, he had three ships. And uh, anyway, so, so Jews left Spain and migrated to the New World and uh, to South America, and a large population settled in Mexico, and and eventually, you know, families lived their lives, assimilated, and uh, my family is descended from from that, and it's it's not unusual when you're when you you are so used to es needing to escape persecution that just in order to assimilate and lay low that you might, over time, what, what had happened is a lot of Jewish people 
lost their their identity because they outwardly converted to the, to Catholicism, and we're living in Catholic communities. And if 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 it was known that they were a Jew, they would be persecuted. So a lot of them like would. I mean, I don't I don't know how many people ate pork, but my family did not eat pork, but still assimilated into the Catholic life, but never had pictures of, or, or statues of Jesus or Mary in the house. And, uh, my mom told me stories of my grandfather, like leaving the Catholic church and, and, uh, not, you know, not falling into line and, you know, not falling in line with their, with their doctrine and stuff. But, so they uh, didn't know they were my mom didn't know they were Jewish though cuz my her father never talked about it. And so eventually um my mom starts a family and uh at that time uh she was you know just still like in this Christian community and didn't didn't still didn't know she was Jewish until like I guess just eventually she just kind of like knew just deep down after making a couple trips to Israel and uh, she told me that there were people when she she was in Israel people would come up to her and talk to her in Hebrew and they and they looked like her and they would mistake her for a relative and and then she just had these series of uncanny experiences and. Remembering back how her family didn't ever fit in, and even I, I, as a child, you know, growing up, maybe I'm just weird, (laughs) that's why I didn't fit in, but never really, we never had this sense of belonging to a, really, like, belonging to a community. I mean, here and there we did, you know, I had, I had friends and stuff, but, um, Anyway, she, after a couple trips to Israel, she she went straight back to see her uh, her father in Texas. He lived in in uh, Brownsville, Texas, and she confronted him. And in, in Spanish, she said, "Dad, what are we?" And he said, "Somos judíos, we're Jews." And he told her everything, you know, about the family history, and she documented it all and videotaped him, and she wrote a book about it. And uh, now she's actually, as I'm recording this, she's in Israel because she's making Aliyah, like Jewish, uh, Israeli citizenship, and and my dad's starting to work towards his. uh, And so, like, it's crazy how things happen but uh, I didn't grow up Jewish and uh, and I was living in San Francisco and I wasn't religious at the time like I said I had stopped going to church and stuff and uh, my mom calls me and, and tells me about this and she says guess what we're Jewish and for me I was like oh, okay I I'm not, you know, I w- I'm not religious uh, at that time, and so I, I didn't really care that much. It was just kind of a fun fact. It was nice to know. Anecdotally or whatever, just, okay, great. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it didn't really matter, but I kind of, I didn't really know anything about Judaism. Until fast forward, when I had that divine encounter that I mentioned that uh, was very real to me. I mean, I'm not going to try and prove to you that, you know, any of that was real. Like, it's not my job to prove. And nor could anyone prove spiritual things, per se. But uh, my point is that uh, eventually, after that, I start, it started becoming now all of a sudden it started becoming more and more important about my Jewish identity. It just started becoming like a stronger thing that was on my mind, and uh, and and that's 
that's the part of uh, of religion or of uh, like a, a, a spiritual spirituality that is so important to humans regardless of like how it takes shape or form whatever the the spiritual nature of humans is undeniable and uh even if you could deny it well i think you would be missing out on on the same kind of thing that holds communities t together and, and keeps them alive like like the fact that uh you know that people who stick together and have this tradition that keeps it keeps them united and beyond that it's the 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 spiritual the spiritualness the the abstract the, the out there the feeling of there's something greater than ourselves that truly kind of makes life more meaningful when it is really up to us to find meaning. I am truly convinced that it's our responsibility to find meaning in our lives. And uh, having a sense of spirituality actually adds to that. And because I think we all need a sense of a higher power, a higher purpose, you know, something greater than ourselves. And you'll, if you, if you aren't there, or you, or you don't, you know, have the same opinion or or point of reference that I do. I think you'll find that with a, a sense that you're there's something bigger, that it will take you farther, and you'll feel stronger about making a difference, and or not. I don't know. What do I know? Some people are fine with our religion. In fact, um, I, re I really like non-religious people because they're, in a lot of ways, they're they're free from all the bullshit that <laughs> religious people have, and uh, and that works. So, long story short, you know, you do you, boo boo. I'm just telling it like I see it. And uh, you're more than welcome to disagree with me. Just let me know about it. At Sean Allen Fenn on social media. And uh, give a little subscribe click. And a little share. And a little bit of liking. Never hurt nobody. So that's it for me until we meet again next week enjoy yourself if you're at art basel have fun be amazing if you're not if you are somewhere else then be amazing wherever you are <laughs>